Captain William Dabney Thurman settled here in 1844 at the age of 24. He had a rowdy past, one that, despite public opinion, he was non-apologetic about. More on that later at the end of this series. In 1873, he received a 73-acre site in lieu of $20 along the northeastern bend of the New River Valley as payment for a surveying job. He was additionally a co-operator, ferryman, horseman, banker, an overall businessman, and more during his life. 1873 also marked the completion of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway Main Line. He saw his land, located at the center of the New River, saw all the miners already digging for coal all around him, but no place to load all this coal. The train offered right possibility. The CNO had added new lines, which now ran from East Coast and Newport News to Cincinnati, Chicago, and south to Louisville, Kentucky, was an important stop along the way to replenish water and coal for the steam engines. For the first decade after the railroad was complete, Thurman and his son ferried wagon loads of produce and tobacco for 20 cents across the river. By 1875, there were 75 people living in houses on Thurman's property, two general stores, and two coal company offices, which had been under construction. The central location of these mines to the CNO led to the location of a Western Union office and an Adams Express company in Thurman. Thurman applied for a post office to be built on his property. He submitted the town's name as Arbuckle after a small nearby community, but it was rejected, so Thurman was chosen instead. Thurman quickly built a town on his property, including a hotel, the Thurmond, a simple frame construction containing 25 guest rooms, and was the first lodging business to operate in Thurman. One house, that quickly grew to about 30 for miners, as the miners came, his small mining town grew very slowly. A passenger depot was added in 1897. In 1898, 175 people are living in Thurman. In 1899, the Hotel Thurman burned down. The depot would also burn down several years later. In 1900, the town was incorporated as Thurman. A new hotel, the Lafayette, locals pronounced it lay flat, was built in 1901 on the grounds of the old Thurman. The three-story new brick hotel had 35 rooms, seven bathrooms. The hotel also boasted steam heat and 400 electric lights. The dining room could hold 60 people. A jewelry store and barber shop operated in the hotel. For many years, it was also home to the post office and bank of Thurmond. The structure included a veranda that extended to the railroad tracks feet away from the front steps. Thurmond at the time had no roads coming into the steep valley. Walking, horses, or rail were your only modes of travel. Those traveling by canoe or raft usually stopped at Thurmond. The waters below Thurmond are loaded with a series of rapids, making further boat travel dangerous without any experience in navigating the rapids. The ground floor of the new depot building was used for the ticket agent's office, baggage room, waiting rooms, restrooms, and a snack newsroom. The second floor housed the signal tower, officers of the dispatcher, train master, and conductor and coal buyer's offices. The depot averaged 15 passenger trains daily in the early 1900s. Intended to purpose solely as a coal camp, Thurman now found outside businesses wanting to invest in the town, and soon the coal camp was turned into its own town, with business workers and railroad workers living there also. Still, Thurman would be the main property owner in town. W.D. Thurmond envisioned his town as a morally strict and religiously puritanical organization. 
but it quickly grew beyond his sole domain. By 1900, there were 26 mines in the vicinity of Thurmond, as lumbering joined coal and the railroad as a major resource. The competition. Local landowner Thomas Gaylord McKell, who owned 12,500 acres across the river from Thurmond, a present from his father-in-law for marrying his daughter, Jean Dunn, Mikkel saw the opportunities in Thurman's hard stance on alcohol and gambling and built a hotel across the river from Thurman's rich. south side community in 1901 at the same time as the Lafayette went up, which he named the Dun Glen Hotel, following the building of his own town, Dun Jean, nearby. He convinced the railroad to build tracks on the opposite side of the river as well to carry guests to Dungeen and the Dun Glen by enticing the railroad with access to the coal mines on his side of the river. The railway was convinced, and McKell got his line, which connected to Thurman across the river. What happened next disappointed and infuriated William Thurman. Sure. People poured in, along with the debaucheries you could imagine. Gambling, drinking, and prostitution were rampant. The coal miners would cross the bridge at all hours of the night or day, and in their drunken state, return home to Thurman, drunk and rowdy, causing problems. Thurman decided to incorporate Dun Glen into Thurmond, but McKell countered by quickly annexing it to his town, Dungeen. Thomas McKell would only enjoy his hotel for three years until his death at 59 on the 15th of September, 1904. On his death, his son, William Cook McKell, took over the business and added an addition to the hotel, giving it an additional story and adding a grocery and bank vault in the basement, in addition to a mortuary, grocery, and dried goods store, drug store, shoe store, furniture store, and bank. The main floor held dining rooms, a perpetually operational bar, ice plant, barber shop, laundry, post office, and an enormous gambling hall. With well over 100 rooms, the hotel additionally housed a restaurant, showrooms for traveling merchants to display their latest products, and a ballroom for dances, music, and theater productions. To the delight of the men in the audience, it also offered dancing girls. Opening night at the hotel featured Don Voorhees and his orchestra, who would go on to release a number of hits in the late 1920s, such as My Blue Heaven in 1927. An evening is night, I hurry to my blue heaven. A turn to the right, a little white light will lead you to my blue heaven. The Dun Glen had bands, fine china, fresh seafood, for which it was known as the Waldorf of the Mountains. It was nicknamed Little Monte Carlo for its liquor and gambling. It was additionally known as the Dodge City of the East in reference to the violence and lawlessness of the area. Coal miners would be paid on Saturday evening and would blow off steam at Southside. Prostitutes and gamblers would ride the train into Thurman on Saturday nights to meet the tired miners and take their money. Some of the South Side saloons were the Bear Wallow, Stackadale Drive, and Dance Hall, and the Black Hawk. Whiskey was sold for ten cents a drink, or a dollar a quart. Two fifty was enough to cover a room in one of the one hundred guest rooms that occupied the top three floors of the Dun Glen. The basement was brick, while the rest of the building was constructed of wood an ominous portent to the building's fate. 
People would take all their earnings and blow it all at a night at the hotel, which never closed. Fortunes were lost with a bad hand of cards. Shootings were commonplace, so much so, a morgue was set up in the basement. One land deal was made there for a million and a half dollars a hundred years ago. An outrageous sum for the time for a mine. It is said that the hotel broke a record for the longest game of cards, 14 years. A fact that is said to have been published in Ripley's Believe It or Not, setting the record did nothing to improve neighboring Thurman's reputation. Unfortunately for Thurmond, Mikkel had allowed brothels, saloons, and other illicit activities to spring up south of the Dunglen, turning it into a red-light district known as Valley Hack. The Dunglen single-handedly gave rise to two sayings about neighboring Thurmond. No Sunday west of Clifton Forge and no God west of Hilton. And... The only difference between Hell and Thurmond is that a river runs through Thurmond. This untitled poem from the early 1900s reflect the area's rough and tumble reputation. You have heard of the California gold rush way back in 49, but Thurmond on the river will beat it every time. There's people here from everywhere, the collared and the whites. Some mother's son bites the dust almost every night. On payday they come to Thurman with a goodly row of bills. Some gamblers get their dough and they sneak back to the hills. Some though never return, alas, and they meet a thug. We find them on the railroad track or in the Thurman jug. Where handy is the blackjack and the price of life is low. At Thurman on New River, along the C&O. Where men are often missing after the drinkers fight and the crime laid on the river, and the trains that pass at night. Captain W.H. Doolittle, CNO Conductor and Poet Thurmond was horrified. He had been unable to annex it, but suffered the consequences of its reputation. But he was a strict Baptist who insisted there be no drinking or gambling in his town. He was beaten so he chose a defensive approach. Thurman knew he needed a sheriff to maintain the peace. He found one in Harrison Ash, a former railroad detective and an agent for the Baldwin Felds Detective Agency, standing at six foot four, weight 275 pounds. Ash was a shoe-in. He became the chief of police of Thurman. The job was rough, keeping peace in the saloons that lined the south side of the new river across from the Thurmond. It was his responsibility to keep the ruffians, gamblers, and thieves who roamed the muddy streets of south side from interfering with the respectable citizens and visitors of Thurmond proper. Ash used all necessary force in accomplishing his purposes and himself became part of an enduring folklore of violence and mayhem associated with Thurman. Legend maintains that he frequented the drinking establishments that he patrolled. In his off hours, he ran his own saloon. Despite its reputation, or perhaps because of it, Thurman continued to grow. The 1900s saw major growth. The Lafayette and the Depot fires taught the town a lesson, and newer buildings were being built of stone or brick. In 1903, the Armour Company built a wholesale meat shipping office beside the Lafayette. Workers at the company lived in the upper floors of the building. The Mankin Cox Building is the oldest in the commercial district. The three-story brick building was built by Dr. J.W. Mankin to house the Mankin Drug Company on the first floor and his surgical practice on the second floor. Dentist Dr. Young was also on the second floor. Mankin's wife was a pharmacologist and mixed the medicines for people. 
The pharmacy also provided toiletries and miscellaneous items. Both provided valuable services for the local sick and injured. Most of those industries came from the local mine, railroad, and timber industries, all dangerous jobs in a region with little medical care. The New River Banking and Trust Company, next door to the pharmacist, owned by Tom McKell, owned the New River Banking and Trust Company on August 11, 1904. I'm sure rival banker W.D. Thurman was not pleased with the competition moving in on his territory. After years of service in Thurman, the bank moved to Oak Hill, West Virginia. The Mankin Cox building had many other businesses in it over the years. This included a pizza parlor, an arts and crafts shop. Standard Dry Goods Company built the Goodman Kincaid building around 1906. This large structure is the largest building along Commercial Row. The second floor had several offices for businesses, including a lawyer. Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Exchange Company had its office there as well. In Thurman, there wasn't much flat land at the bottom of the gorge. The railroad used most of this land for tracks, railroads, and other infrastructure. Building houses on the side of the gorge was difficult. With a population of three to five hundred people, most residents didn't live in houses. Instead, they frequently lived in apartments over the businesses. Most of the upper floors of the Goodman Kincaid building were apartments. The first floor had several restaurants and shops over the years. The most famous restaurant was the Homestead Restaurant. In 1908, a major flood washed away the Thurman Bridge and it had to be replaced. Finally, W.D. Thurman died a wealthy but disappointed man on May 14, 1910, whose dream was to build a faith-based town and ended up stuck with people mistakenly comparing the town bearing his name with hell.